Johnny Murphy, wife of DEA agent Steve Murphy, talks about the danger living in Bogota during the search for Pablo Escobar. One guy comes up to Stephen's side of the car, one comes up to my side of the car, and they start shaking the car and telling him to get out. Well, that was, you know, the worst thing we could do. But it was only two of them. So I, you know, <laughs> a lot of Colombian men are small. And I said, if you can take him on, I know I can knock this guy. You know, I can take care of this guy over here. She said she could kick his ass. They have no idea what they just signed up for. <laughs> yet. A puny little thing. Welcome to Game of Crimes. Welcome back, everybody, to Game of Crimes. This is episode 30, and I am your host, Morgan Wright. I'm here literally with my partner in crime. Your good-looking host, Steve Murphy, that everybody calls Murph. And obviously, you can see Murph's off his medications again, but we're just <laughs> going to allow that to happen. Hey, but before we get in, this is going to be a fun episode, but before we get into talking about it, just a little bit of housekeeping real quick. Guess what? Between Apple and Spotify now, you can go on and review us. Just head on over there, hit that five stars. Folks, it really helps us a lot. We're doing everything we can every episode to help earn those stars. So just head on over there. Leave a comment. Tell us what you think of the show. You know, give us suggestions. We love all of those things. Also, head on over to our website, GameOfCrimesPodcast.com. We've got merch there, um, our mailing list. And every episode that we put out that has pictures, you will find the pictures. There will be some pictures of this next episode. Mm -hmm. Follow us on social media, at Game of Crimes on Twitter, at Game of Crimes Podcast on Facebook and the Instagram. But this is where you got to be. You got to be on Patreon, patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. Man, we, have, we are up over, I think, 52, 53 pieces of unique content now. Um, we just had our uh, end of the year recap for people at our Warden of the Throne, where we go back and we recap all 29 episodes, talk about some of the great things for those things, Murph. And uh, we actually have just, it's amazing the great people we have gotten to just fool them into coming onto our podcast so far. <laughs> We didn't have to, have to threaten them or bribe them. <laughs> no, no, but is. we did it's, have pictures on many of them, yes. Yes, we did. Um, and you're right. It, it's amazing who the, some of the guests that are coming on here, hearing their stories firsthand. And then you know, when we did that recap, it's hard to believe we had that many episodes plus all the bonus content on Patreon. It's hard to believe how much we've done. This, is, this has just been so much fun. As James Brown said, we are the hardest working people in show business. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, but hey, but just but head on over there, folks. I mean, it, we have a lot of fun. All the different levels. We've got new content coming out. We're just finishing up um, episode eleven and twelve of the real DEA narcos talking about the real DEA narcos. So that's a series you got to hear. Our case of the month, um, where we do our uh, narco meter review. We just did review Die Hard. Had our special guest Rick Massa from the North Hollywood shootout mm -hmm. on there. So it's just awesome. You're only going to see this one place. You're only, I should say, see, you're going to hear this one place. That's right. That's right here. That's right. And also go to paypal.com and use our email, Game of Crimes Podcast at gmail.com. If you just want to do a quick pause for the cause or paypal.me slash Game of Crimes, whatever it takes to make it easier for you to help support the show. But before we get started, just remember, quick disclaimer, this is a show about crime. We talk about bad people doing bad things and bad people doing bad things to good people. We do take the story seriously, but we never take ourselves seriously. So that's why we want you here to be having some fun with us. That's right. And speaking of fun, guess what time it is, Murph? How are we going to start off the year? We're going to start it off with what? Our small, small town, town police, police blotter. blotter. That's right. Let's kick this year off right. And let's talk about some of the fun stories that are still out there waiting for us to surface them for you and entertain you. So Murph, did you know that early morning on April 6th, a hay fork woman, I don't even know what the population of hay fork is because I'm not sure what state it is, <laughs> requests to talk with the deputy because her housekeeper is not putting her towels away properly. Oh my gosh, that's, that's horrendous. That's probably a felony, a class, you know, class five felony somewhere. You know, you can do time for something like that. You know what? If I was the local police, I think I would have referred that directly to the FBI. <laughs> they have a whole division for putting away towels properly. Yes. Bath towel police. Uh, the bath towel police. 
hey, what this- was on this woman's mind to think you called the police about that? Good Lord. I just thought of 911. You know, what's your problem? <laughs> hey, speaking of problems, I'm not going to read you the headline first. I want you to read the article. And then I'll read you the headline. All right. This actually comes to us from India. This comes from India. Wow. Kendi Chief Magistrate Thusara Satunga imposed fines today in t- totaling rupees, uh, 79,000 rupees on 29 drivers found drunk driving and pleaded guilty to the charge. Candy police launched an operation on Sunday night to apprehend drunk drivers and prosecuted those on whom the test proves positive. Among the suspects were Trishaw, not rickshaw, but trishaw drivers and drivers of private vehicles. So, I mean, that kind of sounds like an article. You do, you do, you know, you do a, a DUI enforcement lane, you know, sobriety mm-hmm. checkpoints, right? Mm-hmm. However, it's the it's the headline: drunk drivers fail blowjob test. <laughs> 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 this is the challenge when English is not your native language and you're writing headlines. You remember? Well, I'm not going to tell this joke. But you remember the Polish breathalyzer test? Yes, not another breathalyzer <laughs> officer. Anyway, hey, speaking of animals, because I don't know how we got onto animals, but uh, obviously animals are involved in something somewhere. Steve, this next one. This this is an animal complaint, and you know we got some of those. But a caller on West Point Avenue reported that a belligerent squirrel was preventing him from using his boat dock. The caller said he knew nothing could be done about it, but he wanted the officers to know just what kind of squirrels are running around in the community, according to the police report. Oh, jeez. He's probably married to the woman from the first report about the bath towels. <laughs> <laughs> What's a belligerent squirrel? Is he cussing him out? Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's a shrimpy little, uh, you know, FBI agent. I don't know. <laughs> oh, oh. Oh, sorry, folks. Standard, you know, it's it's a state law. We have to make fun of the FBI once per episode, but we do love our FBI brothers and sisters. Yes, but we do. That being said, Murph, so it's now time for what year was it? All and right. since we have New Year's coming up, we are actually recording this intro outro for episode thirty on New Year's Eve. It mm-hmm. is Friday, uh, the thirty Jan- or December thirty first, twenty twenty one. So. I am going to read you an article that's down from your area. It's actually down from Miami. It's the Miami News. Mm -hmm. Comes to us on January 3rd. You just have to tell me what year. All right. Police New Year's dragnet Garner 17. Drunks are declining. Lest of twin holidays shows improvement over Christmas. Small riot staged at Luna Park. The real quick story is, according to police statistics, the new year was ushered in with less bibluosity. I gotta look that word up. Bibluosity. That's a new In the observance of Christmas, there being only 17 arrests for drunkenness and allied violations of the law, such as driving an automobile while under the influence of liquor or disorderly while drunk, as compared with nearly 50 arrests for similar offenses in the other holiday. In line with the statement made on Saturday by city manager Wharton that persons who tilted the lid too much would have to suffer the consequences that the police department would be instructed to preserve order to the best of its ability. The night police force was reinforced by some of the day men. So, Steve, January 3rd, the Miami News, was it 1932, 1922, or 1912? Well, I'm going to say 32. And you would start out the new year 0-1. Woohoo! I'd like to keep that record going. You are nothing if nothing but consistent. <laughs> I gave it to It's easy. Come on. It's easy. What You know, even the odds say out of one out of three, you should at least get one out of three right, man. But you are doing so well. Ah, thank you. Thank you. I like to keep that record going. Yeah, I like – well, the reason – so, you know, the, speaking of the record going, here's a record you are now – you were 0 for 97 on on this particular part <laughs> until you finally got it done. So, folks, if you thought finding Pablo was difficult, if you thought sending Murph and JP out into the jungle to look for Pablo and hunt him down, if you thought that uh, hunting, uh, you know, the most wanted fugitives were difficult, no. Let me tell you what was difficult <laughs> was getting Connie Murphy, <laughs> Steve's wife, to finally come on to the podcast. And tell her story. We've had a lot of people say, yes, let's do it. So, Murph, let's talk, let's talk about Operation um, Big Al because, you know, you had to, you had to, we had to have an operation name for Operation Big Al. We finally landed the big one. Yes, we did. So, and, and first of all, thank you to all of the listeners out there who sent requests in to hear Connie's story. Um, I used to, <laughs> I used your stories against her. And here for Christmas, uh, our oldest daughter came in, our youngest daughter lives here in Central Florida. 
So I kind of employed them to join me, and uh, we kind of triple teamed her into coming on the show. Uh, we've had I've had an outline prepared for months <laughs> of things she could talk about, and she's just so she's so humble, she's so modest. She's like, you know, this is your thing. That nobody wants to hear the story of a police officer's wife or a retired nurse, that kind of thing. And uh, so we got her on for the first one, and and you know, you had to get her to come out of her shell. And towards the end, she was doing a little bit better. But then after we stopped recording that evening, she's like, you know, there's so many things that I wanted to say that we didn't get in there. And I said, well, let me call Morgan. We'll, we'll do a second episode here. And so that's what we did. That's uh, You're going to hear something different on her interview that we don't do very often. And I'll let you explain that, Morgan. It, you're just going to have to listen to it because, you know, normally we end with, hey, now with thanks to, you know, our buddy who came up with this, you know, uh, now stay tuned for the debrief. Well, we said that. And then, first of all, we couldn't get Connie to talk. Then it was like an informant who starts singing. Then we can't get her to stop, you know? Absolutely. So we spent, we just got through spending another hour. So we we added a lot of context, a lot of detail, but we went into a lot more detail on the places they've lived. We talk about Columbia. We talk about narcos and some of the issues she had with that. And we dispel some of the myths. But there, Steve, there is one thing, though. I do want you to confirm. You did catch her in bed with Pedro Pascal. Absolutely, and I have photographic evidence. And if you go to our website, you might just see that evidence. We have a picture of Connie Murphy shockingly, shockingly in bed with Pedro Pascal, which tells me one of two things. Either he's exceedingly charming, dude, or you were exceptionally boring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's probably both. You know, but one thing I didn't tell you, Morgan, is is not only did uh, my daughters help me persuade Connie to come on the, the show and do the interview, <laughs> but I also promised her a new car. So we had to pay. Wait till you get that expensive uh, report. <laughs> denied. That one's denied. <laughs> that is not an approved expense. Well, what, what's oh making God. me nervous, she's looking at the neighbor's Range Rover. I'm like, whoa, I, you know, I was talking about a used car here. So what, what are you going to get? Uh, maybe a new wife. I don't know. No. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, a new car is cheaper than a new wife at your stage in life. Yeah, true, true. I don't know. We're I think, you know, the car prices are just outrageous now, so we'll wait a little bit. She's driving a Lexus. She's good. Steve, this is a bad precedent to set for everybody, is that, folks, if you come on to the podcast and you're a guest, you are not getting a car. I'm sorry. Nope. That's all there is to it. No, and I, you know, it's, um, I tell you what, I am tickled to death that she did it. I'm, I'm so proud of her because she just, you know, you hate to say it, you know as well as I do how much of a backseat the families take because of our law enforcement careers. And I'm uh, just proud of her that she came on the show today. And and what I said, you know, at the end of the of the second interview was uh, she's the best thing that ever happened to me. So couldn't do any of this without her. Which obviously is in stark contrast to you always saying you're the best thing that ever happened to her. So <laughs> we have now clarified that rumor, that misnomer. So, well, Steve, the only way to find out about what she says and what's going on is we have to ask people, are you ready to play the biggest, baddest, most dangerous game of all? The game of crimes. Here's an intro I'm waiting for. Oh, this is and this is a special one. I I love it. So everybody, get in, sit down, shut up, and hold on. Here comes Miss Connie Murphy. The first time she's ever told her story. Well, folks, if you thought catching Pablo was difficult, if you thought the America's Most Wanted was going after some of the most wanted people in the world. We have had to get the U.S. Marshals, the DEA. We've had to call in favors from Zach, who hunted down Victor Boot. We've had to, we've had to pull out the big guns to get the wife of the Murph man, Connie Murphy, on with us. And I tell you what, Connie, I can tell right now just by looking at you, this is under duress. Are you being coerced? <laughs> <laughs> Oh no, I just uh it's not my thing. Well well let, let's I get that, but let's ask what finally convinced you? Was it Steve threatening to walk around in a thong? Was it him saying he's not gonna put any suntan lotion on and just be white all summer? What? <laughs> just to shut him up, basically. <laughs> <laughs> I I coerced my daughter into to helping me with this. Our oldest daughter. Yeah, ah. Monica's here and the, the two ganged up on me. Well, it's obviously not a fair fight because you can definitely handle yourself. But but I will tell you, and I know you don't believe this, but when we first put this out there and when people started asking, a lot of people want to hear your story. 
uh, and they want to hear it for a variety of reasons. It's for the same reason they wanted to hear about Pam Barnum and Michelle Linhart and Sherry Oz, you know, and Claudia Polinar and uh, Cheryl Nietzsche O'Connor and now Sherry Foster. So, I mean, this is you're you're in distinguished company uh, other than me. I mean, mm. uh, you know, I'll probably be the biggest biggest letdown of all. I don't think so. Well, I hey, don't let's have do much this. of a story to tell. <laughs> You know what? I think we're going to walk you through, uh, you know, permission to treat the witness as a, you know, hostile witness. You know, I'm going to have to do some leading cross-examination here. So. Granted. Granted. <laughs> well, let's do, let's do this, Connie. The, 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 the easiest thing to start out with is just, you know, um, you and Steve, you know, at some point you came together, but before you guys came together, where'd you grow up at? You know, what, what did life start out? Let's not go back to you were a babe in swaddling clothes, but you know, like from high school on, where were you at? Okay, I grew up in southern West Virginia, out in a rural area, um, maybe 10 miles north of Princeton, West Virginia, if you know where that is. Um, Grew up on a farm, just simple, good, healthy life. How big was your town? There wasn't a town. It was just a rural community. Um, No town, but, you know... It was uh, it was a great place to grow up because everyone knew everyone. We we all knew who lived in every house. Everyone looked out for each other. Um, was very safe. Um, you know, um, we didn't have much growing up, but everyone had the same. So we never thought any never different. Never knew the of difference. It. No. Yeah, I, I grew up in a small town too. How big was your graduating class in high school? Um, I think we were. We, I'm thinking we may have hit a hundred or close to a hundred. I'm not really sure. I can't remember, but that's what I remember. That's pretty close to a little town of Chapman, Kansas, where I was from. We only had 125 in our graduating class. So, you know, kind of a small area, farming community, same thing, but, you know, grew town. But at some point you left, you left high school and you went to the big college. Where'd you go to college at? Oh, I just went to another, well, it was a, it was a city compared to where I grew up, but it was, it's a small city in Bluefield where... Uh, I met Stephen later. Um, you know, uh, we were just raised to go to go to college. So, you know, mom and dad said, you know, go sign up for college. And I did all by myself. Just check whatever I wanted to do there. <laughs> so what made you pick nursing then? I have no clue. Um, didn't grow up wanting to be a nurse. Didn't you know, have an aspiration to, to do any particular profession. I just, uh, I just chose nursing for some odd reason and loved it. Absolutely loved it. When did you know you were going to love nursing? Was it, I mean, cause normally you, you do your initial stuff, your electives, it's kind of like general stuff, but I mean, did you know the first year that you were going to, you were going to love nursing or did it have to grow on you? Well, you know, back then in high school, you basically chose a business curriculum or college prep. So, you know, I went the college prep route. Some of my stronger subjects were the sciences and math. Uh, So I was well prepared for nursing. So so what was the name of the college then? Was that Bluefield? Yeah, it was Bluefield State College. Yeah. Remember about how many students were there? Oh, no, I have no clue. Stephen might um, have no clue. It was was a commuter college, and so... I think there were maybe 3,000 to 3,500 students or so. Okay. Again, small college like where I went to at. Um, did you, now, did you, did you live in Bluefield then while you were going to school or no. how close was that to where home was? Um, it was about an hour's drive. So I commuted back and forth from home. Yeah. Did you not want to, I mean, was that just simply because of cost at that point or did you not right. want to stay in Bluefield? Both. <laughs> Because you might run into guys like Steve Murphy. <laughs> no, it, uh, you know, I was, uh, other than sounding corny, I was a good kid. Um, I wasn't into partying. I mean, like I said, my parents were hardworking people, and I knew that uh, had a, I had some academic scholarship, um, and I knew that I had to take it seriously because they had high expectations for me. So uh, as hard as they worked for the money that they, you know, had to pay for me to go, I wasn't, I certainly wasn't going to dwindle it away being stupid. I, I just wasn't a party kid. Um, so other than, other than you, your parents, any other brothers and sisters? I have two brothers. Um, my oldest brother is six years older than me. So 
being the youngest and being a girl with two older brothers, you know, I was, I grew up to be pretty tough. They but you also got away with everything with at home too, didn't you? Eh, not really. <laughs> Mom and dad were pretty <laughs> tough on us. Oh man. Well, nor- normally the youngest gets away with everything, especially if they're a girl. So. Yeah. Well, I may have gotten away along, uh, gotten along with, uh, less than they did or more than they did, but, um, I don't remember thinking I could get away with anything by any means. Now, were your brothers really protective of you? Were they overprotective or were they just like roughing you up to make sure you could take care of yourself? Yeah, that was more just roughing me up to make sure I could take care of myself. Like I said, my older brother was six years older, so he wasn't even in school when I went through school. Um, and I mean, I I was an athlete, so when they played basketball, football, whatever they played at home, we always, we had pickup games going on all the time. And, um, I, you know, I was just one of them, no matter how many boys there were, I was the only girl. Um, but you know, I was in there playing as hard as they were. And, um, I mean, like I said, we had pickup games all the time. My mom would sometimes not allow us to go out and bounce the basketball because everyone would hear it and come. <laughs> so <laughs> it'd be uh, it'd be like the equivalent version for guys yelling free beer. Everybody comes out of the woodwork. Yeah, yeah. So everyone would gather and you know, we'd we'd have enough for two teams. Let me tell you what, Morgan, she can take care of herself too. She learned well from her brothers. I was a pretty good shot with basketball, I have to say. Apparently your sights were a little off because you ran into this guy named Murphy in Bluefield. I know. <laughs> how did you how did you run into this tall, everyone, dark drink of water? Everyone has a, a you know has a weak moment. <laughs> <laughs> and it's lasted how many years now? Thirty eight. Oh lordy, it's been too many to count. You know, with good behavior, you could have been out in ten to fifteen years. You know that, I know, right? I know. <laughs> Don't encourage her. But you know, as you get older, you just kind of get into the routine. I'm kind of in the rut now with this one. I would never want to break in another one. (laughs) It's tough. Let me tell you, breaking in guys is tough. So, Uh but, but speaking of that, how did you, how did you run into him? Cause I know we're going to talk later about Narcos. So I don't want to jump too far ahead because Narcos portrays certain things. But, um, in terms of how you met Steve, was it accurate? You know, how did you meet him? And, uh, when you first met him, did you know he was a foolish little cop that thought about, uh, you know, seizing one, you know, couple ounces of uh, weed was the biggest drug bust ever in West Virginia history. Um, I don't know. You know, there's a thing about nurses and cops for some reason. A lot of couples are nurses and cops, but I, I was not living there. I had moved to Myrtle Beach to live at that time. And apparently he had pulled over my best friend, um, well, see, I let to back up a little bit. I worked there in the local hospital for ten or twelve years, um, and I had moved away. And my best friend that I worked with there in Princeton um, introduced us. She told me there was someone she wanted me to meet. I think she was taking a what kind of a class? Um, what kind of class was that she was taking? That he was he was teaching a it's a firearm safety class. Oh, thank you. I was looking for that word. He was teaching that class, and she wanted me to meet him. So, um, what she next... felt sorry for him, or why did she think that you guys would make a good couple? I don't couple? know. I don't know. She just did, and uh, I was single, so um, she wanted me to meet him. And uh, I don't know if she found out he was on duty, or maybe she called to find out he was on duty, and that was a good time to take for us to go by. I don't remember. We were just she and I were out goofing around, just hanging out because I was in for the weekend and introduced the two of us. And I honestly thought he was arrogant. I, I wasn't the least bit interested. (laughs) I thought he was a jerk. It's because I came out in my uniform looking good. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And he's full of himself too. You know, he's still, you know, 38 years later, he's still many, many of the characteristics you just described. Yeah. Yeah. He's still work in progress. Perfection. Yeah, well, I don't know about that, man. You, you've had plenty of years. There's just it's it's kind of hard to change things at this point. But, but what what uh, you know? How did he how did he approach you? Did did he come off like you said? So he was the cop, and you like you were just going to fall for him? And yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was strutting along. You know how cops hold their arms out and that look, that you know swagger. 
going on, and I was like, oh, Lord, you know, I just... Which worked uh, well for him later in Miami when we'll talk about <laughs> DEA and stuff. It didn't yeah. work for me at all. <laughs> well, what, hey, if you got it, if you got it, you got to flaunt it, right? Well, if you got it, Murph, but that's the key point. So obviously you didn't have it because she wasn't interested in you. So Connie, how did he wear you down? What did he do? You know, threaten to come around more? Or what did same he do? Th- same thing as this interview. You know, he just wouldn't give it up. Persistent, huh? Very, Yeah. And let's be clear about this interview. Steve, how long have we been working on this interview, Steve? How many months? Uh, at least six. It's at least since we started the podcast. <laughs> All right. And like I said, finding Pablo was easier. Than, yes, it than was. yes, it was. Yes, it was. And a lot safer, too. Yeah, it's, yeah. Well, it may be after, especially after this podcast interview is over. I know that I'm thousands of miles away, but you're not. You're just a few feet. But uh, you grew up small town. So how did you end up in uh, Myrtle Beach? Um, was it nursing? What you know? What brought you down there originally? Well, you know, you can get a nursing position anywhere. You know, um, that's the wonderful thing about that career. You can. I could go out today and get a job if I wanted to. But just something different. You know, I wanted to leave the small town, go somewhere different, and I did. And, and how uh, did you, what did you think of it when you got down there? Uh, you know, I was fine. It was nothing exciting. I worked the night shift and slept on the beach a lot during the daytime. I was pretty dark. Um, started making friends at work and just, you know, making my own way. But at some point, you met Murphy, you met Steve Murphy, and he just wore you down. So what what did it take? I mean, how long did you guys date, you know, before he finally decided to pop the big question? I think we dated three, three or four years, three years maybe, something like that. Yeah. Man, that's a hell of a test drive, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and just to back up a little bit, when she says she was pretty dark, oh, she had a, a wonderful tan. Uh, well... You know, and I was enjoying being single at the time, and and I had girlfriends there in Princeton. I guess I had more girlfriends there in Princeton to run around with and um, moved back, uh, got a job back at the hospital. I worked at another hospital in the neighboring town in Bluefield until I got back where um, I had worked all those years. And, um, you know, just enjoying the single life, basically. What made you move back from Myrtle Beach back to um, Princeton, you know, and work in Bluefield? Uh, well, for one thing, I remember that Myrtle Beach is dead in the winter. Um, I can't remember the numbers right now, but it seems like they had somewhere of, you know, 40,000 people there in the summer and like less than 10,000 in the winter at that time. And um, when winter came, the you know, it was like a ghost town. Uh, so it really wasn't what I thought it would be around that had a lot to do with it. But but you came back and you start working at the hospital. So during this time, um, ex- at what point in time did you meet Steve? Was that after you moved back or was that while you were still in Myrtle Beach? No, I met him while I was still at the beach. And okay. uh, I think the se- another time after that, when I was in, my girlfriend said, you got to give this guy a second chance. You know, oh, whoa, 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 stop. Wait a minute. Second. Okay. He screwed it up the first time. What did he do the first time to, to, to have to get a second chance? Oh, I told you, I just didn't like him. He was arrogant. He was a jerk. And so, um, um, when she, you know, she said, well, the next time you come in, I think she had spoken to him, uh, and told him what I had said. And, um, uh, the next time you come in, you know, Oh, I want you to go back and talk to this guy again. So he did. And I don't remember the second time. See, Steve, you weren't that memorable. Only the first time when you were being an arrogant <laughs> and a jerk, you know? <laughs> yeah. I didn't talk to him in between the times at all. I was just self-assured. That's it. Of no, course. You, you yeah, know, course we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have internet. We didn't have all those things then either. Um, how long between the first time and the second time? I have no clue. Like a year, longer than a year? She couldn't wait to get back and see me. Oh, that maybe a couple of months, something like that. The next time that I came home. <laughs> Apparently she could wait three or four years. It took you to finally, you know, figure this thing out. So, um, but so you guys start dating. When did, at what point did it get serious? I, I don't know. Do you know? 
I'm old, Morgan. You're asking these questions that are hard. Hey, we're, we're all roughly about the same age. It wasn't age. real memorable. Just... I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can remember. Oh, this is going to be memorable, though, the fact that it wasn't memorable. <laughs> I don't remember anything about him. He was like milk toast. I, you know, whatever. After he quit being a jerk, he just wasn't interesting anymore. Yeah, but, uh, I think it was that second date was all it took. And then, you know, she was just, I swept her right off her feet. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Uh, I can already tell that that's not exactly the case. So, no. uh, but anyway, but at some point y'all start dating. Um, what finally convinced you that you were going to marry this guy? Oh my gosh. I don't know. I guess he just wore me down. And just, just like, <laughs> <laughs> this is a common refrain, no. Steve. You just wore me down. You know? <laughs> not that I'm really interested I, in it. You just wore me down. I wanted to make you go away. Perseverance oh, no. is, an, is a positive <laughs> well, trait. We had a, I realized, I guess, that we had a lot in common. Um, in that I had a motorcycle, he had a motorcycle. So we could go riding together. Um, Get your I, motors running. Uh, so what kind of motorcycle did you have? I had a Honda 360, 350, whatever that was then. CB 350, I think. Uh, she had a Honda 400. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Yeah. Well, oh, 400, okay. Well, my brother had a 350, right? That's the one that I crashed. And then I got my own 400. You crashed? Is this while you were a nurse or did you crash it uh, before that? No, I was in high school, actually. And, How bad uh, was the crash? Uh, yeah, a car pulled out in front of me and I Ooh. T-boned him. Not, not a good thing to do. And so, kind of, were you injured? Oh, yeah. I flipped over the top of the car and landed on my face on the hard top. and But I was okay after. I got a Nice scar on my side. I told Stephen that was a shark bite when I met him. He, th- <laughs> he didn't know any different. <laughs> of course not. He was from Woodfield, West Virginia. A shark bite. So uh, were you wearing a helmet, Nurse yes. Connie? Yes. Oh, thank goodness. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, but uh, but you like to, you also like to snow ski though too, right? We, yes. I, like I said, we, I, we found out we like, we had, had a lot in common. We snow skied. Um, you know, he was he was uh, gung ho on his career, and I was as well. So you know, that was it was easy to understand someone like that. At the point that you guys got married, was Steve still on the police department, or had he joined the railroad police at that point? I think he was somewhere in the transition between the two. Um, he knew that he could never have weekends off working as a street cop. He had these weird, like, Tuesday, Wednesday Wednesday off days. Um, We were both working night shift, and I said, I can't do... I worked, like, six years of night shift. I said, I can't do this anymore. And I had gone on day shift, um, and he could see no way of getting out of that. So that's when he... uh, started applying, you know, other places and worked for the, then he worked for the railroad. I don't remember if we were married then or not, but, um, then he moved away to, uh, to, uh, Virginia beach. And I went to Virginia beach as well and got a, a job there too. So you say you weren't that interested in him, but you followed him to Virginia beach. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, Thank by you. that time we were, you know, we were, he had worn you down enough. You just couldn't stand yeah. to be away from him, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm playing to Steve's, Steve's ego now. Oh, there you go. And I appreciate that very much. Time we had a pretty hot and heavy romance going. Woohoo. Oh, okay. Well, since this is, we're trying to, we're going to stay family friendly on this one because you're the wife. So, uh, <laughs> but, but you, but what was it like um, when you moved down to Virginia beach? What did you think of that as compared to Myrtle beach? Um, I liked Virginia Beach more because there were more residents year-round. There were more people that were, you know, settled in there. Um, and the nurses there were from a lot of different places, so I liked that too. I, I made friends, you know, with people from different states, which was cool. I think he still worked nights, and uh, I, got a, I, was, I got a day shift job there. So that was pretty sweet. Wait, wait, wait. What do you mean pretty sweet? Well, it was sweet that, you know, when I started nursing, and when I got out of nursing school, it was 1974. 
my first payday was three eighty nine an hour. And um, yeah, so you had to start on night shift. You had to work your way up. You had to deserve oh, yeah. day shift. You didn't just say, oh, I'll only take this. It didn't happen. Well, see, that's why I think nurses and cops get along because the same thing works in law enforcement, too. A lot of times, like, you don't start on the police department and go to day shift Monday Mm-mm. through Friday with weekends off. You no, know? no, no. Right. As as Ringo Starr said in his very famous song, if you want to sing the blues, you got to pay your dues, and you know it don't mm-hmm. come easy. I mean, mm-hmm. I ate six months of midnights when I first started on the police departments. Hey, I was going to ask you a real quick question, too, since we've all done this weird shift work. How was it when you started working days? How, how different was that for you as compared to working nights? Because... Working nights was a is it kind of a unique thing too because you have to learn to sleep during the day. Mm-hmm. You have to change everybody's mm-hmm. everybody the times things are open are not always open when you're, you know, awake. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. how was it when you first transitioned to days? And the off days are you know, they're not off days like when you work day shift because you aren't rested, you know. It takes you the whole days off to get rested to go back again. Um, and then your body has to adjust all over again. But when I went to Days, I told him, it's a different world out here. I mean, there's so much life that you're missing, you know. And, and uh, did you start having second thoughts about Steve at that point once you started realizing there's life out there? Never. No, because Never. <laughs> even, even if he was on a different shift, we saw each other in the evenings, and we just planned our off days together. So where did you get married at? There in Princeton, in the Presbyterian Church in Princeton. And then once you officially became uh, a Murphy, uh, did you guys, now you moved, you stayed in, uh, obviously, uh, Virginia Beach for a while, right? Mm-hmm, right. But at some point, Steve ended up getting a job and transferring, or actually the same job, right, but transferred back to West Virginia. What did you, I mean, here you go, I mean, you, you, you left know, Bluefield right. to go to, you were in Myrtle Beach, came yeah. back to Bluefield, yeah. Bluefield to Virginia Beach, and now yeah. you're coming back. Right, right. I know. I should have done that probably. She's like a yo-yo. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, this is going to be a familiar refrain because this is going to be one of many times over the course of yeah. a, a career. Well, you know, I was a young nurse. They didn't bother me. It's just another move. And I just moved back and, you know, got a job doing whatever I had to had to take to get my nursing job back. And, and actually, I think... If I'm not mistaken, I probably got a pretty good job at that point. It was a, it was a new position, a new uh, for me. Um, no, that's not the time, is it? That was the first time I came back. I got the sweet job being the IV coordinator, which we were in charge of the IV fluids and medications throughout the hospital, which was really sweet. The second time I came back, um, had to go back on night shift pay my dues again. So um, um, they opened a new outpatient surgery center. I, they called it day surgery, but they started keeping patients overnight. I started working there and work, wiggled my way for some way into um, ICU, CCU, uh, was ICU surgical and trauma, and then CCU, and then I started began being a night shift supervisor, which at that time, you know, each shift had a nursing supervisor. Now they've changed the whole infrastructure of the hospital, of the nurses. They do it totally different now, but, um, I have, I've had some pretty good, uh, experiences in nursing. So after you moved back though, at some point, um, cause I mean, you know, I know when Steve and I talked, when we did his interview with him and JP, you know, and he talked about moving, it was because of the money originally. So the money for railroad cop was better than it was being Bluefield. But at some point, mm-hmm. Steve gets his crazy idea and he starts saying mm-hmm. DEA. What did you think? Well, um, I, you know, it's it sounded like a good idea. He was, like I said, dedicated to, um, to his law enforcement. So, I mean, I couldn't, uh, I would never hold him back. But were you really aware of what D, I mean, you probably heard of it, but did you really, were you really aware of what DEA did, the kind of things that they would get into? Yeah. I, I mean, he, we were really close. So I read the materials he got. He, you know, we, we talked about it, discussed it. Is that because Steve really still couldn't read after all of those years of a high quality <laughs> education in Blue Well, Shield? I did have to explain a few things, but. <laughs> you guys said you'd never mention that again. Well, you know, in Princeton, 
When I was in high school, I was never around drugs. Never, never, ever, not even weed. Um, some of my high school, high school um, classmates partied on the weekends, but I, you know, I wasn't interested. It wasn't that I was that studious. I just wasn't interested. And, um, but I was never around drugs. Um, but, you know, that's when drugs were really starting to come across our borders, come into the United States. I, my, you know, I was well informed as far as the news. You know, at some point, too, because, you know, if Steve takes this job, it means you got to leave West Virginia. I mean, it's, DEA is not one of those things to where, OK, you get to stay put exactly where you're at and never move again. So you kind of knew. Did you really know what you were signing up for at that point? Um, I think so. Yeah, I think so. He didn't hi- he didn't hide anything by any means. I mean, the the families weren't happy with it. Uh, but, you know, I all I could keep saying to them over and over is this is what he wants to do. Um, and if something happens to him or or me in doing that, well, you know, we went down doing what we wanted to do. So that's kind of the way the way we got through that. <clears throat> that was the only hard thing for me was the fa- leaving the families. Oh, yeah. Um but so, so he, you know, at some point, I have actually, you know, Steve's speaking of being persistent. He's got to drive down to the recruiter and bug him a couple of times, drive all mm-hmm. the way in right. to DC. Right. 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 Um, but when he finally gets that and he goes to the Academy, um, what's it like, you know, now, now you've just, you've only been married, what, just two to three years at this point? Yes. So you got to let your big hunk of a man go off to the Academy and be by yourself now, right? So, <laughs> Right. Well, you know, I had my family there. We had some really good uh, neighbors there that we ran around with. It seemed like a lot of our friends were older than we are. They've passed on now. But um, you know, I had a lot of support people around. And like I said, he, I was into my career as much as he was into his. So... I just picked up extra shifts, um, you know, I just worked my way through it. To make up for the lost money of going from the railroad cop to DEA, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I did make more money than he did. He'll may not, he may not uh, admit that. Oh, no. Yes, he will. He'll admit it. <laughs> I, married a mo- I married a woman with money. <laughs> no, no. But, you know, it's like I said growing up, my parents worked hard and they taught us to work hard. And um, that's just what you do. So um, at some point, you know, when he's going to graduate, they start asking them, you know, where is it you want to be stationed? What was that conversation like when you were thinking about that and thinking, hey, you know, where do we want to go? We both have, uh, you know, we're both water bugs. We love the coast. And, uh, you know, we, I basically said, well, you know, anywhere on the coast, you know, put them all down on the coast, see if we can come up with one of them. And he did. <laughs> but what did you think when they said Miami? Furthest one away, <laughs> I think, on our list. Well, I thought it's time to pack our bags and go. Did anything scare you, though, about Miami? You said you were listening to the news. You know, you, you listened about uh, situations and things that were going on. Was there anything that concerned you about moving to Miami? Not really. I I grew up going to Florida every year for vacation with my parents. We had I had an aunt and uncle that lived in Fort Lauderdale, so every summer we would go visit them. Um, and you know we did a lot of stopping along the way up the Florida coast. So I was familiar with Florida and um, never liked a place as much as I do here which is where we are now, you know. Yes, back in Florida. So I knew, again, I could get a job. I was a nurse. I mean, how many how many professionals can say that? Get another yeah, that's, job. I'll tell you, yeah, <laughs> nursing is one of those things. Everybody, it's it's something that is always in constant demand. You, you never have enough of them, and uh, you've got to do that. So um, he gets through the academy. They get assigned to Miami. But to do that, you guys got to kind of take a house hunting trip, right? So yeah. I would rather imagine, I'm just going to go out on a limb here, but I would say the housing prices in Bluefield, West Virginia, were a little bit different than the housing prices in Miami, Florida. Well, you know, we hadn't been married long enough to even save up um, for a down payment sort of thing. Um, But like I said, my aunt and uncle were there, so um, they helped direct us 
toward the safer areas. Um, we decided it was best to rent an apartment uh, until we learned our way around. Um, and honestly, I waited to see where we were going to settle. No, we, I got a job while we were in the rental, but I like to be as close to work as I can be. He always says, you know, we'll live where you want and I'll make the drive, whatever it is, which he's done more than once. Um, I like to live as close as I can to work. So that's pretty much what we did. We found a house there uh, that was a fixer upper because we knew that's all we could afford. And um, <clears throat> we did a pretty darn good job on that house and ended up someone bought it and they wanted it immediately oh, with cash. So, uh, was her last name Escobar or anything like that? I mean, are they, are <laughs> no, they were Steve, from... you sold your first house for cash to a drug dealer. <laughs> well, it, it was in a brown paper bag. It was okay. <laughs> I think it was some older couple that was retiring in Florida from Buffalo or somewhere. New York. Kind of sounds like some two people I know right now, right? <laughs> right. So we were like, oh gosh, we just have to find a place to live, you know. Which and you guys kind of got a fixer upper this time too, so well, yeah, we didn't plan on it, but <laughs> it comes full circle. But yeah. yeah, so what's it like being? You got to feel like you're kind of like the Beverly Hillbillies. You know, you're <laughs> you're coming out of West Virginia, you know, out of the out of the mountains there, and now you're down in Miami. I mean, it's a whole new cosmopolitan. Yeah. It's a different kind of vibe. Yeah. Um, how did you adjust? I don't know. We just did it together. We just, uh, you know, we go out exploring on our days off and um, we love being over on the beach and we would go over there at night and meet some other friends that we had. We made friends there. They were other DEA couples as well. And, uh, you know, our free time after work, which he didn't have a lot of during the week, but I did, we were always working on, you know, the house, getting it ready to sell again, and I don't know. We just made it work. I met friends again through work. I worked in a cardiac cath lab there, which was actually one of the best jobs I've ever had. Uh, and that's where I started seeing the effects of cocaine on the cardiovascular system and the heart. Well, because it was just, I mean, it was just flooding the whole area down there at that yeah. time. Right. And, uh, you know, if we've got young people in that had a heart attack or was having chest pain, um, it was Good no doubt. Good chance it was something to do with cocaine. Exactly. Exactly. When did you, was that happening when you moved down there or did you see it start to spike after you started working there? I mean, was that already happening when you were in the cardiac uh, lab I think there? it was happening when I got my job there. I think it was happening already. What's it like, you know, you come from an area to where this kind of stuff doesn't happen, you know, and now I you're know. seeing this on a, I mean, it's just, you're seeing kids who shouldn't be having heart attacks, having heart attacks. Right, right, exactly. Well, you know, in nursing, I was just, it was just interesting. It was exciting. I mean, if we had, um, the cath lab is just a fast moving lab and, um, most of our patients would come in, we'd do a cath, they leave, they were, they were fine. But uh, some did crash, and those are the ones that had to go into the open heart center. And, I mean... Can you explain that real quick? Because I think you're talking about cath, like cardiac catheter. Yes, yes. Can well, you explain you know, you, what that is real quick? Yeah, it's where they insert the cardiac catheter into the femoral or brachial artery, either in your groin or in your arm, and go, they feed the catheter in to your heart um, through your aorta and and take pictures, inject a dye and take pictures of your coronary arteries. So, um, and there is one phase of that where it's injected into the left ventricle, which is pumping most of the blood out to your, to the rest of your body. And many times uh, they would tweak something with the end of the catheter and the patient would would uh, go into V-fib, which is lethal, where you had to defibrillate the patient. So to me, that was just so cool. And <laughs> See, you're, you're, sounding, nurses, are, but... nurses are just as bad as cops. We talk about stuff. It's like we say it from a professional standpoint. It's interesting. You go work these crime scenes and you do stuff. But like, 
you know, um, I've hung around enough nurses and doctors, you know, I've went through the EMT training, you talk about ventricular fibrillation, you get the paddles out, you know, you've got, to, there's also, but, but just from a professional standpoint, you got exposed to so much more stuff down there than you might have up in Bluefield, right? Right, right. She's pretty smart, isn't she, Morgan? I don't know. Marrying you, I'm still, that's, that's, that the jury's out on that one. But uh. well, the, the cool thing is a lot of, most of these patients that would go into V-fib and we would defibrillate them, they would say, what happened? And we're like, oh, nothing, you, you know, things are fine. And just a hiccup. Yeah. We yeah. got your heart. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just a hiccup. Well, we didn't tell them that till the procedure was over. Yeah. You overdosed <laughs> on cocaine, you idiot. You nearly died. You ruined your heart muscles. But otherwise than that, you're going to be fine in a walker, but, in a wheelchair. But then, you know, there were patients that literally crashed and had to go in for open heart surgery. And uh, although, you know, it was a much more, to us, it was more serious, um, more intensive. Um, you know, we had to, you had to know what to do. You had to be able to move and get that patient transferred quickly. Um, so we ne you never knew when you went in if, you know, what was going to happen that day. It was, uh, it was... It was a cool job. What about violent uh, crime, you know, and traumatic injuries like that? Were you mostly dealing with things along that lines, like you say, drug ODs, or were you were were things coming in through you guys like gunshot wounds and, you know, bad trauma, things like that? Well, at, you know, at at this job during this job, I was, you know, I stayed in the cardiac cath lab, so everything that we saw was cardiac related. Um, now to back up, when I worked in in the trauma or surgical intensive care unit in Princeton. Now that's when we got car wrecks, gunshot wounds, those kind of things, um, which was, an, you know, it's another level of excitement in a nursing career. But a lot of this too, it sounds like it also prepared you though for being able to be the wife of a DEA agent because you guys are going to go to some danger. I mean, it's, it's not like Miami was a very, I mean, even though, it might've been safe for you guys. Miami wasn't a very safe place during that time. There were people yeah. being shot and killed, dope mm -hmm. deals going on. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I know people from back at that time, it's like the homicide rate. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, did you not even worry about yourself when you guys were out walking around at night, exploring the areas that you might walk into something? Well, um, we were smart enough to know, you know, where the high, high crime areas were. I want to correct you something. Those. You were smart enough to know. Don't say we <laughs> stuff with Murph on the line here. <laughs> Just you were smart enough to know. Well, <laughs> he knew Miami better. I knew Fort Lauderdale better. And um, when we were, we would, if we were out at night, we would usually stay more in the Fort Lauderdale area on the intercoastal. That, that was the cool place to be then. Oh yeah. Uh, that's a pretty area. I've been a had a friend who had a boat driven, you know, or oh, boated yeah. through the intercoastal. Yeah. Right, right, right. And well, you could get on the, the the taxi boats and go up and down, you know, on and off where you wanted. It was it was fun. It's called bar hopping. Bar, right. Well, <laughs> you just walked into that, Murph, because speaking of that, <laughs> it was my understanding is that there came a point in time to where you had to doubt the veracity of your husband's alleged truthful statements that – Apparently, you and him and Kevin were all going to meet at this bar, and uh, they were supposed to meet at a certain time. And Steve, if I recall right from episode five with Kevin Stevens, weren't you and Kevin driving like uh, 120 miles an hour to get someplace <laughs> on time to meet Connie? <laughs> yes, we were. That's back when uh, Kevin was driving a five-liter Mustang, and I had an IROC Z28. Um, and we had, we had been debriefing a deformant there down in Miami. And so when we were leaving, I called Connie to tell her we're, we'd meet her at Uncle Al's, which was this uh, sports bar in Davie, Florida, which was not too far from our house. And so when, when, when Kevin and I got on the interstate, we decided to race. And we pulled in. We had, we'd already ordered the beer, had a table, you know, had munchies on the way when Connie, Connie came walking in. And it wasn't a pretty sight. She thought we'd been there all afternoon. I never knew what he was up to with Kevin. <laughs> it was work. I'm telling you, we were always working. Yeah. Kevin well, was single. Kevin was crazy man. Well, let's stay on Kevin for a second because this is something that um, I know my wife dealt with when I was a trooper, you know, and a police officer detective. I've, other wives have dealt with this and husbands who have wives on the job. You know, there came a point in time to where there was a really scary situation with Kevin. And obviously that was when Kevin got shot. Um you know, and 
of course, nobody wants to get that kind of news. And then no, somebody knocks at your door, comes to it. Your first thought is, you know, also, what about Steve? What about going on? When that shooting happened, um, what, what's, what's in your what's in your head at that point? Did you think, what the hell did we get? I mean, you know it's going to be dangerous, but when this happened, you got an informant killed, Kevin, you know, pretty shot up, uh, and Steve right in the middle of stuff. Did you think, did, 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 do I really understand what we're getting into here? Um. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I do. Um, um, I don't I don't know how to answer that. Well, to back up, when that happened, I was at work and he called me um, and said, um, you said something like to the effect that I'm OK. I just want you to know I'm OK. And yep, that's just all I can tell you now. And I thought, <laughs> OK, that's fine. Nice to call me at work. I'm OK. And tell you're, me you're OK. OK. We're all OK. And I thought, well, he's never done that before. So uh, maybe you told me to turn on the news that evening or something. I don't, it was in the afternoon, right? I think it was in the yeah. afternoon was the time you called me. Yeah. Um, and I knew, we were close enough to, I knew when something big was going down with his work. You know, people say, are you worried all the time? No. Um. I probably knew more than a lot of, than some wives. I won't say a lot, but I knew when something was, something big was happening or when he was just having the boring day of doing surveillance on something. Not that something can't happen all the time, but I knew when the danger level was heightened. And so I think that day I did know um, they were, you know, doing whatever it was they were doing that, um, uh, what was it, a buy or something? Anyway, um, I knew something, you know, must have happened, and I can't remember if I got home, turned the TV on, what I, and when he was able to, he called me again. But he would usually, I would usually know when something's going down that day, and after it was over with, he would usually give me a quick call and say, it's all done, we're fine, or, or not. Was he concerned that you might have seen that on the news first before he had the chance to call you? I f yeah, I think so. I think that's why I got the call. But, uh, you know, I'll, that was the furthest thing from my mind at that point. Usually, you know, I would just go to work like a normal day and expect to hear from him when things were over, which was usually, you know, the way it went down. And this time it didn't. Yeah. And again, that's one of the things that a lot of people, it's weird too, because the, when the first thing out of your mouth says, Hey, I just want to let you know, I'm okay. Everything's okay. You start going, okay, why did you say it that way? Then obviously it starts, you know, triggering, but Steve, you're about to pipe in something. Hopefully it's informative and educational and, uh, you know, funny, but if not just stay, you know, stay mute. No, it's just like every, you know, all the other important things I say. <laughs> uh, no, you wanted to call her just to let her know. I, let I wanted to call her and let her know I was okay because the, we saw the media out there. They were at the hospital when we got there with Kevin, and the informant had been flown in on life flight. And you know, they weren't at the same hospital, away. were they? No. No. That's what I'm saying. Kevin, Connie's at one hospital. Kevin's at another hospital, right? Right. Connie's at Plantation okay. General up in Fort Lauderdale, and we're down at Jackson Memorial Trauma Center down in Miami. Okay. But it was just, a, you know, you don't want her to switch the evening news on and find out that DE agents have been in a shootout and she hasn't heard anything from me. As if that wasn't dangerous enough, right? So, I mean, you, you go through things like that. I mean, I know, Steve, uh, well, there is one story I want you to weigh in on because I think that you came close to kicking Kevin's ass one time. Wasn't it when he was drunk and showed up at the house and I think tripped or <laughs> fell or something happened uh, in, in front of your house? Oh, me or me? No, it's Kevin. Oh, oh well. Or which time you mean? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I never, you know, Kevin was not a good influence. Well, it was okay. <laughs> you know, Kevin's like the little kid you want to keep your kids away from. <laughs> the Eddie Haskells of Leave it to Beaver. <laughs> but, uh, and then, well, you know, when I... Sh that night when I showed up at the bar, I had been working. I was tired, and they're sitting there, you know, all kicked back, all giggles, and I'm like, what, what are you doing? And I had to drive Kevin home, and I just, I was tired. I just shoved his butt out, you know. <laughs> no, he's, he's talking about the time that we had been to uh, Russ, uh, Russ's mm -hmm. 
And we'd been at the oh, bar when you all came afternoon. Home and you all tripped across nothing in the floor. Yeah, that, that's that was it. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't I, I may, and that's is that the time that I took him home and and just shoved him out in the parking lot. That's the one. <laughs> God, I wish you guys could see the eye roll here. <laughs> I the, did. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm like, I do not want to deal with this. You know, you deal with enough crap at work as a nurse, and I'm I'm not going to deal with this this evening. Hey, I, I, yeah, I'll be the first to admit we never grew up. Okay. Hey, yeah. Now, guys, guys yeah, yeah. never do. Guys, guys are continuous kids. Well, right. Connie, as if that wasn't you know exciting enough. Obviously, there's a lot of exciting things going on, but I hate to say that you got. It's not that you got bored with Miami or you know bored with South Florida, but mm-hmm. it sounds like you both kind of arrived at a mutual decision that hey maybe we're ready for a change. Well, yeah, we you know, uh, um, he couldn't get enough of his his work. He loved his work. I love my work. Um, that was probably the hardest time it was for me to give up my work because I really did love that position. Um, but yeah, we were. I can't remember if you brought home papers from DEA or what, got different places to transfer. Um, I don't know exactly. There was nothing that preempted us des- deciding to leave except um, he knew <clears throat> that most of the drugs he was working on was were coming right out of Columbia. So to him, Columbia was the place to be um, if he was going to make any difference at all. And I was on board. I was, you know, just, you know, I'd moved a lot. Fine. Let's go to foreign country. See how that is, too. Well, but before he got down there, though, he had to go through language school. So I assume, did you stay in Florida while he was in language school? I stayed. uh, We had, and that's after we had sold the one house, bought a new house that had just been built. And I stayed behind for a month or something. And then, you know, I was used to staying behind because he was always going on a TDY here, a TDY there. Um, And I would, I stayed behind and then joined him later in Washington. Yeah. And uh, you guys, is that was, so when you guys moved out to Washington, do you remember where you lived that first time? You mean while he was in language school? Language school? school? Well, the uh, government put the guys up. Uh, that was in his class. I don't know if that's where all of the guys go in these apartments in Falls Church. Okay. Um, so um, there were other agents, wives, and families there um, that I ran around with or would see during the days. And um, and that now, did you get to, did you get to take any training as well? I mean, if if you you know because no. there's a no they just they're they're just nope. going to drop you cold turkey into Columbia. You got it. Yeah. Now there were. There are other agencies, State Department is one of them, um, that put their spouses also through training. And I, I'm not certain, but I think that they also guarantee them a job there. Yeah, State Department is also a cover for the CIA because the CIA <laughs> ran their wives through the same schools yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. So they had, but I mean, when we got to Columbia, we had a lot of benefits they didn't have either. So. Yeah, like the like JP, right? You know, Deal the benefit it. of his company. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, we're gonna explore that here in just a little bit. But hey, but 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 at some point too, you also have to take a trip to go to, to Columbia. I mean to take to take take a look around. So was that your first time out of the United States? Other than our honeymoon cruise, and I don't remember where all we went, St. Thomas. Uh, do you remember everywhere we stopped? A four-stop cruise, I think it was. Yeah, the Bahamas, Dominican Republic. So that was more like the Caribbean, you know, that, is it Caribbean or Caribbean? I mean, let's settle this discussion. I don't know. I'd say Caribbean. Caribbean. That's what I say, Caribbean. Uh, it, it's Caribbean cruises. But anyway, but yeah, but but flying now, so but I, let's put it this way now. Columbia now is the furthest south you've been uh, out of the United States now. Right. So what did you, what was it like flying into, uh, one thing we all have in common, we've all been to Bogota now, but what's it like flying in that first time? What was it, what was it like compared to what you thought it was going to be? Um, well, honestly, um, you know, like I said, we didn't have the internet to do our research then. So all that we had to read up on Columbia was what they mailed to us. Uh, the DEA office in Washington mailed to us. So I read all of that. Um, 
I learned uh, all that I could about the culture um, before we arrived. Um, Had you learned to speak any Spanish while you were in Florida? None, none. You know, in Florida, then um, the only community that spoke Spanish there were the was the Cuban community. I think there's quite a few other language that are th- languages that are prominent there. I have a friend that just moved there, um, but uh, and they were predominantly in uh, Miami. So little the little Havana section and yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's some great food down there. Been down there too. I mean, it's just some mm-hmm. great food, great culture, mm-hmm. great cars. But mm-hmm. um, yeah. But you fly into Bogota. So what, what's it like down there? Uh, your first night. I mean, is it uh, is it uh, peaceful and quiet, or is it like? Mm. Uh, well, first of all, the airport itself was nothing that anyone could have prepared us for. It was just total chaos. Is all I can say. It was open air. Um, it was pretty dark when we got there. I mean, all we heard was Spanish, and, you know, <laughs> I think the funny thing about Spanish, the Spanish language is, if you can't understand the Spanish, if you can't understand what they're saying, they just get louder. Americans do the same thing. <laughs> it's, it's, it isn't that you don't hear them. It's, <laughs> so, so Spanish was just... They think by talking louder and slower, somehow you will magically understand... Yeah, it makes you understand. ...the language. So uh, he knew what they were saying, and, you know, I didn't, but it was just, there seemed to be no organization whatsoever to this place. I mean, I'm used to organization, and you couldn't, you couldn't tell where the lines were or what the lines were for, were for. and my main interest at that time was getting my cat, because we, we took a cat. <clears throat> so if you want to back up a little bit... I had this cat way before I met Stephen. She made that clear on a regular basis, by the way. I did what? You made it clear on a regular basis. That's right. Because the cat didn't like him, and he didn't like the cat. Yep. Uh, And I had to remind him the cat was there first. So um, they had this, it wasn't a love-hate relationship. It was more of a hate-hate relationship going on. But that was, you know, I told him I would go to Columbia if I could take my cat. Game over if if I if I couldn't. So I went through um, all the steps that I needed to take him, and um, we made sure he was in the cargo section on the plane when we left Miami. So my interest was getting my cat back. <clears throat> and uh, like I said, you could not tell if there was any organization whatsoever in that airport, and how we ever. Managed to get to the point where, you know, we were demanding our cat back is is quite the miracle. But that was a story all on its own. Well, that's what I was going to say. Just it, it is it is not easy to bring an animal into another uh-uh. country, is it? No, 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 no. You know, and I had all the papers that I needed as far as his, his vaccinations. And, um, and I, they put us in this room to make us wait for him. It's like, what? I mean, the luggage all came out. Where's the cat, you know? And uh, it was it was just a hassle. So we finally got him, and an agent there showed up who didn't end up being one of my friends anyway. He didn't like cats. So now I'm dealing with two men that don't like cats. And uh, he takes us to this god-awful place to stay that night. And he said, well, this is the only place that allows cats. And I'm like, okay. You know, if it has a bed and I can have my cat, I'm, I'm good. So we get to this. Uh, this place was more like a boarding house, I would guess. And the doorway was like a temporary door they had put up. And it was open at the top. So at the top, they didn't build it up to the ceiling. It was open. So as long as anybody wanting to break in wasn't over four <laughs> feet, you were fine, right? <laughs> and, and the bed barely fit in the room, so we could barely, you know, scooch along each side of the bed, basically, to get in the bed. And how's the? And first of all, tell us about the cat. What's the cat's name? Puff. Puff was a white, white Persian. And just so you know, they let Puff go from the airport because after they got to meet him, they didn't like him either. Nobody liked Puff except her. So now, Murph, hold on. You know, <laughs> you know, I got two cats here. So I don't know. Uh, you got just, Spud Nut and I forget the other one's name. 
now Rosebud and Fanny. So, uh, but, but, but the other concern too is, you, I mean, you're a cat lover too. So it's like you're down there in this foreign country. Is the cat probably has been cooped up a lot, but you really can't let the cat roam around no. the the oh, the, no, bo- no, no, the boarding no. house for fear that she he will poof. Right. Puff will poof. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, he could be for dinner. So uh, anyway, and we came home from the embassy the next day, and the uh, maid had left the windows all open. And I'm like, oh, my God, where is he? Well, luckily, he was he was under the bed, scared to death. But No, yeah. I did not pay the maids to leave the windows open. I know that question's coming. So you admit you're denying it, Steve? I admit I'm denying paying the maids. <laughs> it's not a real denial, but uh, but what was that first night, though? I was going to say, getting back to that part, the first night was no more than we laid our head down. Then we hear gunshots outside. And I'm hoping it's fireworks. I'm like, is that fireworks? He's like, no. I'm like, well, okay, well, this is... Steve, you should have played it. Yeah, celebrate. They're celebrating my entry into the country because in a couple of days, Pablo's going to turn himself in and the problem is over. And these gunshots were close. But, you know, I was like, I thought, well, this is the way it is. And this is the way it's going to be. Yeah, but I mean unsettling or did you just did you just accept it i mean you've got that clinical mind too like a nurse in other words yeah. in sense like a cop you're just used to dealing with stuff yeah. um you, whatever presents itself that's what you deal with but did it not in the back of your head go yeah you know maybe florida wasn't so bad you know princeton <laughs> bluefield you no, know <laughs> i didn't think about going back we were there so you know it's like okay this is what we're going to be dealing with now hopefully it, is, it isn't worse than this well, so, but the other thing too is you got to tell me because Steve, of course, takes credit. He's down there for just a couple of days and Pablo turns himself in, but that kind of takes the wind out of the sails though. I mean, it's kind of like one of the biggest reasons to go down there is to go after Pablo. And now Pablo says, Hey, I'm turning myself in. Mm-hmm. It's it's over. I mean, mm-hmm. did you, did you feel like Steve thought, oh man, you know, this is not going to be as fun as I thought or, you know, what, anything on that? Well, I think it, you know, I think he was let down. I think he was ticked off, too, that I think, uh, you know, they allowed Pablo to make a sweet deal. You know, he was ready to take on whatever assignment was given to him, even if it if it wasn't going to be that. We were there for our time. Uh, so it was both of us were pretty much just like accepting of whatever, you know, whatever we're dealt, we'll deal with it. Well, let's talk about the first time you got to meet what would eventually become Steve's main partner, Javier Pena, JP. When's the first time you got to meet JP? You know, the first few days we were there, we met so many people. I can't tell you. I'm sure I met him that day. I can't tell you uh, if I met him or not. Um, as Stephen was assigned to work the, the Escobar uh, cartel with Javier, Well, that's, you know, when I got to know him better. And um, he was just an all-work, you know, serious-minded kind of guy. It's like, you know, you'd say, oh, Javier, this is Connie. Mm." You know, you might get a grunt. (laughs) You might get a grunt. You might not. Um, He's way too preoccupied with what he's doing. Well, with that and chasing women, uh, that was my... (laughs) (laughs) He was discreet about that. He was very discreet. There, see, there's something I didn't know. He was discreet. Very, you know, if it doesn't... Very. I mean, we would be at parties and Javier would disappear. And um, I'm like, where did Javier go? And, he's, you know, Stephen would say, well, he probably has a date. Well, that didn't occur to me. And I'm like, oh, okay. But now knowing Javier more, I'm thinking, no, he probably went home, took a nap. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it is age now. Yes, that that could be true. Yes, true. So as Steve's getting uh, as Steve's getting acclimated, um, do you make a decision about working? Like, what are you going to do? Oh yeah. Um, are you know because obviously you can't. It'd be too difficult, right, to be a nurse, but you have to find something else to right. do. Right. They had a, a clinic in the in the embassy for all the agencies, but they had um, a Colombian filling that position. So that was, you know, that she had been there several years, and that wasn't going to change. Um, so I knew I had to find a job somewhere where, you know, like I told you, the other agencies had jobs for their spouses. So there were only so many jobs in the whole embassy for spouses. And, uh, I just thought, well, I can volunteer somewhere. So I started volunteering, um, 
in the CLO office, which is the community liaison officer for state. Um, it's for the whole embassy, but it's State Department position. Started volunteering there because there was only one lady in that office, and she was pretty swamped with work. And then I also started volunteering down in the uh, mailroom, which was the APO. Um, and that was a busy little center because, you know, all the mail's coming in and out there. And there's a lot of mail for whatever number of people were in the embassy because, you know, everything was mail order or that was their communication, more or less, to the United States. So, and that's where I saw the Time magazine. What well, was Samana magazine, right? I think Samana. I did have it here. No, it's a Time magazine. Mm-hmm. You're right, it was Time. It's their equivalent of Time magazine. On the front um, of the magazine, it uh, said Colombia was the top um, country for international adoptions, which I was not aware of. So I was like, oh, look at this. Because we had already tried to adopt a couple of times in the United States, and we quickly understood that if you wanted a healthy newborn in the United States, you paid more than we could ever afford. Um, But if you wanted an older child or a child with disabilities, then it were it was you know less amount of money, and we thought this is nothing but a, a baby business. We're not going to take part of it. Uh, so we just you know we were happy. Just the two of us were like, well, you know, could be a lot worse. We're 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 happy, and that's just fate. So uh, when we saw that article, we were I was taken back, and I took it up to him. Said, look at this. So that's uh, what first, you know, gave us the idea of adopting there. It hadn't occurred to me. And I've, that's surprising, too, to think that Columbia was a top destination for that. Is that. Do you think that was because of the uh, violence and the number of babies that were being basically orphaned because of the, the drug war and the cartels? Or? Yeah, the country, you know, there was just a lot of... Um, you know, that in Colombia, you have a high class and a low class. And a, a low class meaning, you know, economical, but they, they um, unless you were professional there, you were considered in the low economical class. And uh, it was, uh, we saw a lot of uh, poverty, you know, it was really in your face there. It was, there were lots of children living on the streets um, they had their own little gangs and their own leaders. Um, and, I mean, there were just a lot of children just wandering around dirty and with without parents there. Yeah, and that's got, I mean, it's, it's got to tug at your heartstrings, too. But as you're thinking about that, though, too, so that kind of puts it into your head. But at the same time, though, things are still busy. Steve's working quite a bit. What's it like? You're trying to think about adoption. You're also doing work there at the embassy, but then Steve is out doing a lot of times, you know, Lord knows what, right? Um, so did you worry about his safety as much in Columbia? Um, did you worry about it just the same, or did it not affect you compared to, like, being in Miami? It compared to being in Miami. Um, the only difference was you didn't see the danger in Columbia, um, and you knew it was— it was closer to you. Uh, I mean, we knew we were cautioned to be aware of, you know, what's around us. Uh, and we never thought that in, in Miami. Because I want to put a placeholder here we'll talk about later because it deals with Puff. Because I know in Narcos, they portray something happening to Puff, which, you know, really doesn't. But um, But for your own personal safety, was there a time that you were concerned that your personal safety was at risk? Um, was there an incident or anything that might have happened that you said, man, this is, you know, close call? Well, only the one time we were on our way home. And, and you know, like I said, back up, um, DEA, had, DEA did have benefits the other agencies didn't have. So there was some jealousy on that end uh, from the other agencies. <clears throat> one of those was he had a uh, take-home car, which was a bulletproof vehicle. Um, you know, they ha- had the shatterproof panels, which were like an inch thick, a half inch thick or something on the insides of the windows and the 
across the windshield and um and the other agencies didn't didn't get that um they had to ride an embassy van to and from work um but anyway um we were on the way home one day and we got blocked in by some well, they were dressed as cops on motorcycles. We didn't know if they were cops or not because it was very common for them not to be. And uh, <clears throat> I thought, wow, well, what are we going to do? And we ra- we radioed the embassy, the Marines, like we were supposed to, but we knew it would take a while. It was during rush hour. Um, rush hour there is nothing like you've seen here in the United States. People think this is bad. They have no clue. Um I mean, there, you just make ever how many lanes the cars will fit. Like, there's no... Yep. <laughs> it's not <laughs> It's not three lanes. It's how many widths of a car you can get there. And um, we were... They blocked us in. I think at that point, we were on, almost on a side street making our way to our apartment building. And um, he radioed for them to come. Uh, another DEA wife heard us and sent um, one of the supervisors, DEA supervisors that lives there that has the, what is it, Uzi or something, machine gun he had yeah. with him. That's what the supervisors carried in their cars. Um, but, you know, this guy comes up, one guy comes up to Stephen's side of the car, one comes up to my side of the car, and they start shaking the car and telling him to get out. Well, that was, you know, the worst thing we could do, but it was only two of them. So I, you know, <laughs> a lot of Colombian men are small. And I said, if you can take him on, I know I can knock this guy. You know, I can take care of this guy over here. She said she could kick his ass. They have no idea what they just signed up <laughs> for. Yeah. A puny little thing. Um, <laughs> so we were considering that when the... Um, the supervisor showed up behind us, and and then also another police car, which was uh, uh, legitimate, came and uh, spoke to Stephen through the window and and recognized who he was and got us out of that. So that must have been the time when those two uh, little wannabe thugs, right, Steve? They were they were actually cops, weren't they? Uh, it was three guys, and they were military. Or military, yeah. okay. And they were just, but she's right. They were just little guys trying to be tough guys. Thing was, though, you could see they had weapons on them. Ah, and that's one reason why you know you, that's that vehicle's the safest place for you at that time. Well, there was uh, no doubt in my mind she couldn't take care of that guy. <laughs> He'd have got a can of ass whooping opened on him. Now, Connie, I have to ask you about another incident that happened. I want to know if Steve has ever told you about this. Uh, the time that Steve ventilated a Volkswagen. With his nine millimeter. Oh yeah, he was coming home that day. Uh, he was pretty ticked off when he came in, telling me that story. <clears throat> I was like, "Oh God." Was it more Steve that you had to clean your weapon, or you're going to have to write a report? <laughs> then I had to go hide out in the parking lot for an hour at Uni Centro before I could go home because I was so close to home when the shooting happened. I mean, the alleged shooting. Uh, the alleged. <laughs> no, we already we already <laughs> determined that from before. So the fact that your wife is a witness to this, Your Honor, <laughs> case closed. Yeah, but no. Uh, so, but, but Connie, you know, but obviously there's, there comes a time too, to where life in Columbia, it's, you know, I've been down there, not, not nearly as long as you guys have, but there's some just beautiful areas, you know, mm-hmm. Montserrat, the restaurant, mm-hmm. you know, uh, bought my daughter, one of the Ruanas mm-hmm. at one of the markets, mm-hmm. you know, just so much culture there. Mm-hmm. But at some point though, um, you, you gotta have, you gotta have a little fun. So what'd you guys do for fun? I mean, um, uh, in addition to, you know, socialize with the other people, did you go to events? Did you did you get a chance to actually go out into the community and get involved in some no, things? No, we weren't allowed to do that. Um, you know, that was just their security protocol. That, and that was all the embassy people were supposedly controlled or uh, we had guidelines that the uh, RSO office there that handled the embassy security, they would put out guidelines, you know, as to what's happening around the city. And accordingly, these were our restrictions for the weekend. So, and my first job there was with the, in the CLO office, that lady moved on. I took that job and then I job shared with another DEA spouse. Um, 
And so we were, you know, we were handed those um, at least, I think they put those out on Thursday or Friday, so everyone knew, knew what the Americans should or should not do that weekend. But then you've got this group of DEA who don't go by rules. So they pretty much went on their merry way. Some weekends they would maybe be a little more cautious, but it still didn't stop that crew from doing what they wanted to do, which was Friday night go to, was it Mr. Ribs for TGIF? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, drink and have appetizers for several hours. And on Saturdays, many times we would have outings as a huge group. We went horseback riding one weekend. Uh, we'd go up to Maserat and up on the mountain, what was called Circa, what was that called? Circa? Circa Villar. Yeah. It was a highway that went around the uh, curvature of the mountain that overlock, overlooks Bogota uh, for dinner. And it was the same you know, so um, we... Speaking of drinking, did you ever participate in this horrendous DEA activity when uh, agents would move on and they would call it the circle of gold? Never. <laughs> never. Had to never once. Never <laughs> once. I was always the designated driver. Always. Sometimes for more agents than just my husband. Did you actually get to drive down there on your oh, own? Oh, yeah. We took my car. Um and which was a Pontiac Grand Am, which stuck out like a sore thumb down there. Obviously with no bulletproof windows. So no. if you get costed by military types, it's yeah, on, right? right? And so while he was gone so much of the time to Medellin, I would take my car for a spin, you know, out in the city. You know, I'd go get groceries or whatever by myself. Um, I was only stopped once. It was near Christmas time and the policeman wanted money. Uh, and I told him I just got all these groceries. I have no money, and he he let me he let me go on like stupid gringa. But um, also, we had diplomatic tags on our car. So that's what I'm about to yeah. say. You had tags, but and you also, even though I know Steve, you did. But Connie, were you? Did you have a diplomatic passport too? Yes, or a regular passport. I had a diplomatic passport. Dip pass yeah. Okay. And earlier, I will, we uh, we have a rule, but since you're the nice guest and we don't want to, we have a rule about acronyms. So you said RSO and that's regional security officer. Right. So right. That's the RSO is in charge of, you know, that security and the weekend safety brief, yes. like don't, here's the stupid things you don't Perfect. do, Perfect. which then the DEA members promptly go out and violate almost every exactly. safety exactly. briefing. Yes. Even when I would say. Well, we look at those as suggestions. Those are suggestions. Yeah. No, it wasn't. It wasn't a suggestion. <laughs> And I would say, Steve, you're getting chewed up. J just sit back with your tail between your legs and let Connie tell the story. Go ahead, go ahead. I would say we aren't supposed to be doing this. We aren't supposed to be doing that, you know, and. And then you'd end up doing it anyway. Yeah. And then you had agents like Javier that would go, um, blah, 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 you know, mumble under his breath. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're gonna have to talk to JP about this too. So, hey, but but it's but it's all fun and games until somebody escapes from prison. So, yeah, <laughs> you're having fun and games, and then June of 1992, Pablo decides, yeah, I'm not really scared of that Murphy guy. I'm gonna take it on the lamb, as they say in the old stories. See, they, how did life change the minute Pablo escaped? Well, I didn't see Stephen very much. Um, and he was... Was that a good thing? Uh, <laughs> not down there. That's how you there. keep a marriage happy. <laughs> That's right. Not down there. I mean, you know, I, I felt more restricted, of course, than I was in the United States. So I didn't free, feel as free to come and go. And I didn't know my way around as well. I would go out on foot many times. And there was uh, a nice park between our building complex and the... Uh, there was a there's a mall nearby, maybe mm, five blocks away or something. <clears throat> um, and I I would go out walking uh, a lot, um, but he was gone. And uh, I mean, there was one time that they had guards on our building because there were um, because he was working on the Escobar thing, and they didn't know me. So I would just walk past them and go for my walk and come back. They had no clue I was the one they were guarding. You got to love it. <laughs> you got to make you feel good. Hey, remember me? I'm the principal here. 
but did a lot of the rules change after Pablo is your weekend safety briefs? Did, 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 did it become more restrictive or was it in a sense kind of life, you know, life is, you know, usual, um, during that well, time? None of the other embassy people were the least bit concerned. They didn't know what they're working on, nor did they care. Um, and actually his supervisor at the time, I won't, drop any names, but <clears throat> his supervisor at the time would even ask me, oh, where's Murph today? And I'm like, he's in Medellin. You're the DEA. Aren't you supposed to know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hello. His name was Jackass. And well, anyway, I thought, well, that makes me feel really good. Most of the time, if he was out of town, Javier was in town. So, you know, they would do this tag team thing at Medellin. And uh, so I could go into the embassy. Well, and then at this point, I was working for DEA in their file room. I was a file clerk for them. So um, I would go into work. I could go on the embassy van if I called in advance so that they would come by and pick me up. But lots of times I would just take a cab in, which I wasn't supposed to do either. And um, so I'm detecting, a, I'm de Steve, I'm, I'm seeing where you got this rule breaking thing <laughs> from is that she didn't follow the rules. You didn't follow the rules. Well, JP didn't. Does anybody follow the rules anymore? Suggestions. That's all they were, suggestions. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you're also responsible for your own safety. At some, I mean, yeah, I could do something stupid, get in the, right, get in the cab with the wrong guy, but obviously that didn't happen. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, he was gone a lot. But, and then getting back to Javier being in town, they would talk— um, I guess over a protective uh, communication system, whatever that was, in the DEA office every morning um, at a, eight o'clock, nine o'clock. I don't remember, but I would try to catch Javier when he came out of there to say, "Oh, hey, you know, how are things going? How is he?" And I would get the usual, you know, meaning he's okay, <laughs> and go. He'd go on back on down the hallway to his work. So, uh, you know, again, I just, like all other times, just uh, knew to stay busy. And that's what I did. And, and, and the hardest part sometimes is the, is the not knowing, right? Things are going on. You don't yeah. know, you yeah. know, right. um, waiting for a knock or a mm -hmm. phone call. Um, the time Steve was back, was he actually really no. there? I mean, was it like? No, no he was so preoccupied with uh, what was going on up there, um, what he had learned while he was there or seen while he was there and also concerned Javier was up there. And, you know, when the one that was in the embassy was the link to Washington, so it was also keeping Washington informed on what they're doing there through, through Toft, who was their country attache, DEA country attache, because they worked directly with him. Did, how much did Steve, I mean, I know there's limits and a lot of times with spouses, you tell things that you might not tell other folks, but did you really know how bad it was while Steve was working on it, the number of people that were dying? I mean, you were hearing about the bombings, but did you really get a good sense of all the stuff Steve was saying? Not all of it, um, but I did have a good idea how, mis how many Colombian police officers were dying and the funerals they were going to. And that sort of thing. And then don't forget that the bombs were going off in the city of, of uh, Bogota, you know, uh, through this time. So, you know, the I guess the violence was really stepped up at that point. And like I said before, you had to be aware of what was going on around you. That was your personal responsibility to do that. So... When Steve was down, though, in Medellin, um, did you guys get to talk much while he was down there? Was it like hit and miss, or did you guys have a regular way, schedule of trying to talk to each other? No, we didn't talk regularly. Um, every now and then, uh, maybe if I was at the embassy, um, he would call in. Um, he, I don't remember him calling our, our phone in the condo. Um, we learned early on that there were a lot of clicking on the line in the... Uh, our personal landline at home. So we were careful what we said to anybody on that line. Steve, was that CIA? Was that? Uh, yes. No, I, I suspect it was. Yeah, yeah. That's, that, that's the only way they could get solid intel and report it back as their own, right? Oh, it's unbelievable. You may see this in the, you may have seen this in movies, but there were times when we would, 
go in the bathroom, turn the shower on, and he'd tell me something. You never knew who was listening. Well, no, that's absolutely right. I mean, it's like, and the other thing too is, it was well documented at that time, especially we saw with the Cali cartel, but with Pablo and stuff, they've got people, I mean, they had people bought off in the telephone company, you know, in the service industry, everything. I mean, they had a, uh, they had a vast intelligence network. So it would have been no shock to know that you guys were under surveillance from friendlies and unfriendlies. So, but, so I got to ask you, Connie, though, I mean, you are obviously a very intelligent person, uh, in spite of Murph, but, um, <laughs> but you, nursing degree, you do all of this stuff. You understand how dangerous it is in Bogota. You know what life is like down there, but yet in the midst of all of this, and I mean, and you go through the trough of despair things, they think Pablo is not going to be caught. But then in October of 93, this is a couple months before Pablo's caught. You guys decide, hey, it's time to adopt our first daughter, mm -hmm. Monica. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. You got clicking on the line. Mm -hmm. You've been uh, you've been assaulted. You know, you've been uh, approached by well, tiny scrawny soldiers, <laughs> but still, you know, you got scrawny With soldiers. <laughs> what the hell made you think this was a good time to adopt somebody? Well, uh, we could not. DEA was a non-dependent uh, post, so. We were the only agency at that point that could not have children there. And our our time in country was coming, you know, was slowly coming to an end. Uh, we stayed an extra year, but that was coming to an end as well. And um, we could only, we had to leave country within six months of having a child one way or the other, <clears throat> whether I had a child or whether we adopted a child. So... You know, just like in the United States, we had to go through a lot of steps to to get her. And um, I, I was when I worked in the CLO office, um, we had a list of adoption agencies there for Americans that came to Colombia to adopt. And so I had gone through that list, and the whole time we were there, I I worked on it, and I connected with uh, a Colombian. And that was, um, she was in charge of the entire uh, child protective services in that uh, county. Uh, they caught something else. Department. Department, yeah, which included Bogota. And, um, and so I would, I stayed in contact with her off and on most of the time after I saw that article. And and she was had her eyes out for us, you know, a baby. Well, <clears throat> we really wanted twins. Um, and although apparently she said there are quite a few Colombian twins born there, there was none at that point. But she did, you know, come up on Monica, and she just thought, you know, she would, uh, the age she was... Uh, I think she was nine months when she f when she found her. Ten months when we got her. Um, so we knew if we were going to adopt there, we had to, you know, the timing had to be right. How did you know she was the one? I didn't. Stephen did, um, and it's crazy because they. She called us, said she had a baby for us. We went to the office immediately. She gave us a picture. I tore that picture apart. I was like, well, her eyes are, you know, this. Her eye, her ears are this. Her, I don't know. Is there something wrong with her? It's just she looked normal. And Stephen thought she was one of the prettiest babies he'd ever seen. He wanted to get her, like, that day. And, <clears throat> and you know, I took her, took the picture back to the embassy, had everybody critique that picture, and everybody said, she's a beautiful baby. What's the problem? Uh, I said, well, what if I don't like her? Then what? I mean, it's not like you go to a store and you're like, I don't like this. I, you know, can I have a, can I exchange her or return her? It's not, you know, I, <laughs> I was, it was crazy the things are going through my mind. And the cra the funny thing is, is that he and she are extremely close and have always been. She's dad's girl, daddy's girl all the way, even today. And then, as you know, we... um I said, well, you know, the lady's name was Alicia. I said, Alicia, we want another baby. Now what are we going to do? And we are running out of time. She didn't have anything else. And she said, 
Well, let's hold on before we get to that part okay. because you're you're skipping over a huge big piece here. Oh, really? <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, a couple of things <laughs> like let's talk about bringing her home. Let's talk oh. about Pablo's killed. Oh. You know, in the end of that thing. Oh, okay. well, yeah, just that little thing. The whole reason you're down there to begin oh. with. You know, you just we why digress. So, but talk about bringing her home that first day. So, I mean, Steve, tell the truth, everybody. Steve, Steve was a blubbering mess, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we. We took him, took her straight to the embassy because, hey, she's the only baby, the whole DEA group, who was the largest group in the embassy, you know, she's the only baby. So to them, it's like, it's their baby too. I mean, they went through this whole thing with us. So everybody was excited that day and we took her straight to the embassy. And I, I was like, I have a baby here somewhere. Do you all know? Because they just took her and went with her. Now you've got another manhunt. There's <laughs> Pablo and now where's my right. baby? You know? And the women were like, oh. You know, and they were all taking her and taking her to their office. And I'm like, and she was fine with all of it. They told us, um, you know, you need to be prepared because this is traumatic and she may not smile for a long time and that's normal. And she was just like, parte, you know. <laughs> Part. So how did you come up with the name Monica? Because that was not her original name. That was her name. Oh, that was, it was her, name. her name. And uh, oh, so okay. we, we kept her name. I had never considered that name, but I did like it. And I said, well, let's let's keep her. Her name is Monica Alexander. And I said, that's beautiful. So we kept her name um, on the way home from the agency. She wet on me. And Stephen thought that was hilarious. For some reason, that's always been hilarious to him. It's now, still let me funny. Tell you you got to get Chris. It's still funny. It is. Still, <laughs> it is you know, and as a father too, if you got boys, because I had boys too, along with the girl, but you, you're not fully christened until you go to change the diaper and you get peed on by the kid, one way yeah. or the other. Well, so. you know, I worked pediatrics for like five years or six years, and so I, I, that was fine. Um, but we took her to the embassy, and then we we took her home, and I went part time at that point, and uh, we had our maid who was more like a little grandmother to us there. She was a little Colombian lady uh -huh. that we just fell in love with. Um, I mean, she took care of Monica as if she were her own and helped lead me to, you know, helped go with me to doctor's appointments and those sort of things with her. Now, did she, did she speak English or just only Spanish? She spoke English. Um, she worked for the Marines in the Marine House for many, many, many years, and she was self-taught English speaker, but she was she was just awesome. Well, I don't want to know what she learned living with the Marines. <laughs> she, knew all, she knew all the words. <laughs> uh, I was gonna, crayon. Get me crayon. <laughs> Very um, proper little lady, actually. Who learned English from the yeah, Marines. I got to hear this one. <laughs> she, she treated those guys because they were young, you know, just like they were her boys, you know. All of them were. They were they were post one, you know, at the embassy and stuff, you know, um, always, you know, youngsters, yeah, usually unattached. So now you've got uh, a nine, she's 10 months old now by the time you got her home. And this is going October, November. Things are heating up for Steve. How tough was it for Steve to be away from his adopted daughter, who's by now, we understand now, daddy's, you know, daddy, she's a daddy's yeah. girl. But how tough was it? You've just adopted her. Mm -hmm. This thing is now is really heating mm -hmm. up. Steve is probably hardly even home at mm -hmm. all, right? Right. Well, I, you know, I think it bothered him more than it bothered me because he hated to be away from her. Um, she was so much fun at that age. And as, you know, as you know, babies are. And um, I went about. Then they grow um, up. You know. And become teenagers. What I did before. Only I took her with me. I, I went on walks, took her to the mall, took her through the park. All the things you would do with the baby um, that I could do there. Hey, quick question for Steve, though, while we're here. Steve, how much did that affect you mentally? Because then you got to keep your head in the game. I mean, you got shit going on all the time. I mean, it's it's literally, and not to overblow it, it's literally life and death out there. And you've got a brand new daughter at home. How do you how do you work on keeping that focus? But at the same time, you know, you got a kid. You know, this sounds cliche when you say it, but you have to compartmentalize what you're doing and what's, you know, what you're paying attention to at the time. So, like, you know, the Colombian cops knew we'd adopted her, and they always had questions. How's your baby? How's your wife? You know, and what do they think about you being up here? And other than that conversation, you know, it was back to business. So you just had, you just really 
had to stay focused because of all the the missions we were going on out at the time, you know, going out on the Huey gunships yep. and going out doing surveillance and paying informants and meeting informants. It, it was, uh, you, you couldn't, you know, it sounds cold to say this, but you couldn't consider your family at that time. You had to stay focused what you were doing. Yeah, that the distractions would actually be harmful as opposed to helpful. Exactly, um, exactly. So, Connie, between the time you adopted her and before, now Pablo's killed basically almost two months after you adopt um, Monica. Did you take any trips with her or did you were you in country the whole time between the adoption and when Pablo was killed? I think I did come back to the States, uh, introduce her to the family. Uh, I traveled with her by myself once, at least once. But she was still technically a Colombian citizen at that point, right? Yeah, well, we kept her uh, not too long. We They accepted us as like foster parents so that we could go ahead and take her and keep okay. her. Um, but it didn't take long for the process to go through there. And it had by the time I took her to the States, and I didn't have any problems at all. She was just, she was a really, really good baby. So although I was by myself a lot, she was a good baby. Probably because of the lack of the influence from Steve. That's why she grew up so good. Yeah, yeah but I, I taught her well later in life. Don't worry. But but let's let's lead up to this because this is all going to tie into talking about narcos later. But um, what was it like for you when you found out that Pablo had been killed? Well, I knew that he would, you know, he would be thrilled that that chapter was over, that he had, a, you know, accomplished something. Um. And it was going to be better having him back at home more. I mean, it was the stress level with him was over the top. So uh, it was it was a relief, n- not only for us personally, but for for the Colombians because you know they were uh, the whole thing just led to such a level of violence. Well, that's one thing I want to touch on real quick too before we hop too far forward. Is Steve, you and I talked about this. Uh, it was the Centro 93 bombing. Connie was with you, right, when that happened? You guys were coming back from somewhere? She was, uh, yeah, I don't remember now. I don't remember. I remember Javier and I went out to the site later. Right. I thought you guys may have been shopping or coming back from when the explosion went off. You heard it over like the uh, embassy radio or something. Well, we had uh, we had been to that Centro 93 shopping center a couple of days prior to that. And okay. I think we heard about it on the good time, like your AM FM radio, the announcement. Right. And that's one of the places that I would go by myself when I drove my car as well. It was a really nice well, area. Yeah. Yeah. And so when that happened, that had to like really register and hit yeah, home. Yeah, yeah, it did. And, you know, the deaths of all the innocent Colombians, the Colombian people are just the not, uh, you know, I just have a softness in my heart for them. They, um, For all the stuff they went through for so many mm-hmm. years. They're good people. They're hardworking people. They're good people. They were very accepting of me by myself with my poor Spanish, um, you know, how were you treated, though, being the the, the gringa, you know, the, uh, the the white gringa from the United States adopting uh, one of their babies? Well, they seemed very gracious that, you know, we could take this baby that they knew didn't have a very good future there. Um, they were very gracious to us. Um, yeah, and they were they were happy for us and for her. For because they knew that she was going to get a life, yes. and uh, you know, just you had no idea what her future yeah. the would be. The girls um, there have a rough for life, of course, than the boys. You know, they're oh yeah, they're uh, they're very dominated, or were at that time. But the other thing too is when uh, it's December third or December second, nineteen ninety three. Uh, uh, now Friday is December third is when they all returned back from Medellin. Pablo's dead. Uh, JP's back. Um, did you do anything to surprise them returning from Bogota? Oh, yeah, well... Or on their return to Bogota? The um, Intel tech, is that was that her position? Um, she and I planned a surprise celebration in the, in the DEA corridor there in, at the embassy um, because, you know, no one was as excited as the DEA crew were. Um, we just had a big... Uh, a big party. 
we had posters and banners and streamers all over the place when uh, he got back. And how long, this is kind of like going back to college, but how long, well, you weren't a partying type. How did the hell did you know how to throw a party? You must have learned it from those drunks at the Marines <laughs> or the DEA. Well, I knew how to throw parties, just not drunk parties. <laughs> <laughs> So, but uh, this party went on for quite a while, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, it did. It went on in the wee hours of the morning, the best I remember. That was fun. Well, and I know you being a responsible parent, not that Steve was, but that you were, somebody had to take care of Monica, right? So how did, who took care of Monica while you guys were out partying and, you know, karaoke the night away? Well, the same lady that I spoke of um, that was keeping her during the day, she was keeping her that day. Um, and she was excited, as excited about the news as we were, and she just slept over and, and kept her that night, not knowing what time we'd be in. And as usual, I was the designated driver this. <laughs> to get him home. Was this as close to the drunkest you'd ever saw, Steve, prior to him quitting drinking? Uh, was that the night that you had to stop and barf out the door? I don't remember. Uh, it could have been. <laughs> it could have been. Oh, That's yeah. usually followed the visits to the Marine House. Well, but if you were that drunk, Steve, you probably wouldn't have remembered either way. So I'm so glad that my dad made me learn to drive a, a stick shift before he let me drive an automatic transmission because all of the G-rides there were sticks, and so I knew how to drive that. So here I'm driving this huge Ford Bronco that must have weighed a million pounds, and and lo and behold, he had to throw up. So I had to figure out where to pull over. You know, it's not easy finding a place. In, it's like New York City. You just have City. to do it quickly. It's like New York City. Well, and the other thing, too, is if that's the same armored Bronco, those windows don't roll down, oh, right? you got to open the doors. He had to open the door. Yeah. Oh, Murph, we're getting some more G2. On. I'm going to hold this against you for this entire next year. Oh, we're getting some good stuff. That, let me, well, I'll be the first to tell you, it wasn't a one-time event either. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime we went to the Marine House, it was usually well, an issue. I did have to say, to my credit, dear, um, I did help him up into the apartment. There were other wives that just left their husbands in the car in the parking building overnight. Or pushed them into the parking <laughs> lot you know, the, like you did with Kevin Stevens. Yeah. <laughs> she did that because she loves me. <laughs> she loves you. It's the love shack. Let's not, let's not, come, come on guys, get a room. But uh, <laughs> speaking of that's not the first time you did it. You guys, that's not the first time you adopted a kid either. So um, a few months later, and actually just a couple months before you leave Bogota, you decide to pull the, the uh, figurative trigger again right. and adopt. Right. Mandy. Now, I, I actually I got him confused. Right, Mandy was not her. Mandy is the one who that was not her original name. Right, right, right. right. Mandy's name was okay. Daniela, and we changed it. So why did you go back down to Medellin to do this? Well, um, Alicia, she uh, she told me that she was re she was retiring, and I'm like, oh, you can't do that. You know, we need we want another baby. So she put me in touch with the lady who was over this adoption agency in Medellin, and it was run by the Catholic Church. So I was in contact with her, and, you know, same thing. She, because Medellin was further, she mailed us a picture of Mandy. Same thing, except different. He was like, is something wrong with her eyes? Her eyes look crossed. You know, he was like, and I'm like, this, look, I worked pediatrics. This is one of the prettiest babies I've ever seen. She's perfect. And, and you know, everyone at the embassy, again, same, was on board. And to this day, she's my girl. She's always been mommy's girl. And um, so we... See, it all goes back to the picture. Steve saw no fault in the first That's picture. So crazy. You saw no <laughs> fault in the second yeah. picture. Now, do your kids do your kids know that you almost gave them back because their pictures did not look good? <laughs> we hadn't accepted them at that point. <laughs> it's not, like, oh, Monica, Mandy, this is going to crush them if they listen to this. They episode. know all this. Hey, players, that's the end of part one. And if you thought we were done, well, we're not. 
we had a little bit more to go, but then Connie decided she had more to say. So we've actually got a lot more detail, a lot more interesting stuff that you've never heard of before. Plus, Connie makes a huge admission about her and Pedro Pascal, who played JP in the series Narcos. So stay tuned for part two coming out Thursday. In the meantime, go check us out, GameOfCrimesPodcast.com, our website. We've got a lot of pictures about Connie there, especially that special one with Pedro Pascal. Also, check us out on the socials, at Game of Crimes on Twitter, at Game of Crimes Podcast on Facebook and the Instagram. More importantly, go check us out over at patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. We have a ton of content, over 55 pieces of content now, everything from the real DEA narcos talking about the real DEA narcos to our review of Die Hard, the world's greatest Christmas movie ever made, to our case of the month, even more. So go check us out, Game of Crimes, over on Patreon, patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. So stay tuned for part two of Connie Murphy and the Real Housewives of DEA Narcos. 